All right, so you might remember from our chapter on motivation that we skipped some of the information that had to do with emotion, so I figured your vacation was a really good time for you guys to learn some of that. Uh, so I think that this is chapter 9, possibly. Um, you can check in your own book if you brought it home, but I think that it's chapter 9. Uh, and so we're just going to go over in this lesson the three basic theories explaining emotion uh, and kind of how they each treat um, emotion a little bit differently and how they give us a little bit of a different perspective on how we are to understand emotion. So uh, the reason why the emotion um, part of your book is in with motivation is because emotions, a lot like motivations, are going to energize and direct our behavior. Um, so when you're feeling a certain way, that's going to change the way that you actually behave. So an example is if you're feeling super duper angry, that's going to change the type of behaviors you engage in. Um, just like when we went over motivations, we said that when you're feeling hungry and you have that drive, you're going to seek out ways to reduce that drive and engage in drive reducing behaviors. Emotions can also channel and direct um, the way that you're going to behave. When you're feeling sad, you'll choose to do certain things. When you're feeling happy, you'll choose to do different things. Uh, so emotions can also kind of serve as motivations. So that's why we can we include them in this chapter. So um, Kind of what is an emotion is probably the first question we should address. Um, what is our definition of emotion? So emotions have three components. Um, you kind of get what an emotion is, but you probably have never thought about, like, what is it defined as? Um, and so, yes, it's a feeling, and we can list all the different types of feelings you can have, but it's a little bit more complicated than that, um, at least when we look at it from a scientific perspective, like we would in psychology. So we, says, we say that there are three components. Um, first, you have a component of physiological arousal. So if you take the example of an emotion like um, sadness, your body responds when you're feeling sad different than it would when you're feeling happy. Um, a very basic difference in terms of physiological arousal would be when you're feeling sad and you're feeling depressed, your entire body is feeling depressed. So your heart rate's going to be a little bit lower, your blood pressure therefore is a little bit lower. When you're feeling happy, you're a little bit more upbeat and your body's a little bit more stimulated. So your heart might be a little bit faster, you're going to have higher levels of arousal possibly with happiness. So first component is that idea of your body has a certain level of arousal. Second, you have what is known as expressive behavior. This is just a fancy way of saying that when you feel an emotion, you tend to show that emotion to people in your environment. So when you are sad, um, obviously the first thing we think of is you tend to frown. Um, when you're happy, you tend to smile. When you're sad, you might be sobbing. When you're happy, um, certainly you also might be expressing tears, um, but you have different types of behaviors that people can immediately see. Um, the most common expressive behaviors are centered around how your face is working, um, which we'll kind of get to later on in this chapter. Um, but your facial expressions um, are a key component to how you are going to be communicating emotion and also how you're going to be feeling emotion. Um, the third component, and possibly the most important, is the idea of a conscious experience. Um, you can't feel an emotion unless you're aware of what the emotion is. So even if you are crying and your body's reacting a certain way, you can't say that you're feeling sadness unless you're aware of the sadness. So that conscious experience is you knowing what it is that you're feeling. Um, so moving on, uh, there are kind of two what we could what we would consider like controversies surrounding emotion. Um, I mean, they're not controversies. I think that would plague you on a day to day basis. But this is what psychologists are going to spend their time kind of researching. Uh, so the first question uh, and the second one actually have to do with those three components we just talked about and kind of what order they occur in. Um, maybe the common sense view of emotion is going to hold that, you know, you feel a certain way first, you have that conscious experience first, and you have that emotion first, and then your body reacts accordingly. Um, but it's actually a controversy over whether or not that happens. So first question, does physiological arousal precede or follow your emotional experience? So um, example, are you crying because you are sad? Or are you sad because your body is reacting a certain way and because you are crying? So kind of like what comes first? Does the expressive behavior come first and the emotion follows? 
or does the emotion happen and then the expressive behaviors follow after the emotion? Um, a second example would be like, are you angry first and that anger then fuels an increased heartbeat? Or does your heart rate increase and then that increasing of your heart rate cause an emotion of anger? Uh, and then the second controversy is about cognition. Uh, so do you have to have cognition involved first before you have a feeling? So do you need to label an emotion? Do you need to know what the emotion is cognitively in order for you to actually experience it? Or can, can you experience an emotion without having to think about it? Um, so those are kind of the two controversies, sort of like the order in which things occur. Um, and we're going to talk about three theories of emotion that attempt to explain these controversies in different ways. Um, so the first of the three theories, um, which are listed here, uh, is going to be the James Lang theory. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Canon Vard theory, and then we're going to go over the Schachter two factor, uh, also known as the cognitive theory. Um, but these are going to be basic attempts to kind of tell us how emotion works, um, the order in which all of these components of emotion kind of happen in. Um, does arousal happen first? Does emotion happen first? Does thought happen first? Um, and so each of these has kind of a different take on it. Um, each of them seems to maybe work better for different situations. You can kind of see as we go through them how they sometimes do all make sense, um, some of them more so than others. But if you take a given situation, maybe James Lang can explain it better than Canon Bard can, um, but then you take a different situation and then Canon Bard will maybe seem to work better. Um, probably the most currently held view of emotion is going to be the third one, the Schachter two factor, um, but that's just because um, cognitive psychology itself tends to be a little bit of the most accepted field of psychology, so that one is the most modern take on it. All right, so the first theory of emotion that we'll go over is the James Lang theory of emotion. Um, Possibly you might remember uh, the last name, James. Uh, we went over a guy named William James um, in the very beginning of the year. I don't know if you remember who he was or what he was about, um, but William James is considered um, one of the founding fathers of psychology. Uh, when we talked about how psychology transitioned from more of a philosophy into a science, uh, William James was the author of the first psychology textbook, so he took all the information and really gathered it together in a scientific way. Um, he's also known for being an author, for being a philosopher, um, related to Henry James, the famous author, um, so kind of a big deal in the early years of psychology. Um, Carl Lang, not really as important as William James, unfortunately, um, but both William James and Carl Lang kind of arrived at the same way of understanding emotion around the same time, so they both get credited with this theory. Uh, so with the James Lang theory of emotion, if you kind of look at the flow chart that's provided here, um, it says that you have two important components to emotion. You have kind of the arousal component, so that physiological arousal. Um, here it's talking about maybe an emotion of fear, so arousal associated with fear would be something like your pounding heart. And that arousal happens first, and then what follows is going to be that emotional experience. So James Lang said that you have your body react first and foremost, and then you feel an emotion. Um, so the way I kind of think about it is they viewed each and every emotion as having a certain physiological recipe that creates it. You literally cannot experience an emotion unless you have some sort of physio physiological arousal. So in order to experience fear, um, there's a certain combination of, you know, heart rate and salivation and dilation of pupils that needs to happen that's going to literally create the emotion of fear. Um, if you have the emotion of sadness, your body first has to mix together a certain combination of, again, um, amount of salivation pounding of heart, um, in inhibition of digestion, certain physiological changes need to occur in a very specific way in order to create that emotion. Uh, so sometimes I like to think about it as like each emotion has a recipe. If you're more of a scientific mind, you can think of it like a chemistry kind of a lab or a chem experiment. You mix together certain ingredients and certain elements and it creates something specific. Um, so James Lang really thought that each emotion had this specific combination. Um, 
Now we kind of think it might be a little off base just because your body reacts the same way to multiple emotions, um, but it certainly was interesting for the time. Uh, you can kind of see how it might happen, especially if you take the example of maybe um, you're driving down like a super icy road and you hit like a patch of ice. Uh, and your car starts to swerve, um, your body reacts first, and then you feel the emotion second, which is the order of events that James and Lang said would occur. All right, so second theory of emotion is going to be the Cannon-Bard theory of emotion. Again, two people came up with it together. Um, first one is Walter Cannon, who, again, hopefully is going to be a familiar name. Um, I don't know if you can remember back to when we went over motivation and we went over Washburn and Cannon, um, and they did that experiment where they wanted to see if stomach contractions were kind of the cause of hunger. Uh, so they swallowed a balloon and they measured, like, when does the stomach contract and when doesn't it, and does it match up with when you're feeling hunger pangs. Um, so Walter Cannon certainly a big name in a lot of different areas of psychology. Uh, Bard, again, he's kind of like Lang, not as important for psychology, so he doesn't get to go first in the hyphenated name. Um, and Cannon and Bard didn't work together, but they were working at the same time, so they both get credited with coming up with this theory. Um, so Walter Cannon uh, was doing a lot of his research at a time when people were really interested in kind of how the nervous system works and how the brain can kind of communicate information really, really instantaneously. Um, they had just kind of discovered uh, structures such as the thalamus, which if you remember is kind of considered that um, sensory switchboard of the brain, uh, which is going to take incoming information and it's going to route it really, really quickly. Um, and so they're just discovering um, how quickly the brain can really operate and can transmit information. And so this theory of emotion is saying it's kind of silly to say that our body reacts first. There's like a lag time, and then we feel an emotion, which is what William James said. The James Lang theory says there's going to be a lag between when your body reacts and when your brain understands it and says, okay, that's the emotion. Um, Walter Cannon said, no, our brain can work a lot quicker. You can process things simultaneously. You can process things instantly. It doesn't make sense to say there's this time in between. Um, so the Cannon-Bard theory says we have a simultaneous occurrence of physiological arousal and emotional experience. So here the stimulus we're looking at again is going to be the sight of an oncoming car. Uh, so that's going to be something that's kind of fear-inducing. At the same moment that your body reacts with kind of this like pounding heart and increased um, blood pressure, you're going to experience the emotion of fear. So the exact same time these two things are going to be happening. Um, so Ken and Bard, um, I kind of think, I don't know if you know the word concurrently, meaning to happen at the same time, but it kind of sounds like the name Canon. Things are happening simultaneously, concurrently, pounding heart, and the emotional experience of fear. All right. So the third theory of emotion um, is known by a couple of different names. Uh, you can call it the Schachter's two-factor theory of emotion. Um, you can call it the cognitive theory of emotion. Sometimes it's known as Schachter and Singer's theory of emotion, because Singer was another guy who kind of discovered it. Um, but regardless of what you call it, uh, this is going to be the third and final theory of emotion, and this is when we finally see some theory trying to take into account the way that our brain actually processes things. So even though Canon Bard is talking about kind of nervous system processing, it's not talking about the element that cognition and interpretation has on emotion. But the way we interpret things has a lot to do with the way we experience them. So the Schachter two-factor theory of emotion, first thing you have to understand um, are what the two factors are that it's referring to. So if you look at the diagram and the flowchart, you see the two factors are going to be listed right here. Uh, first factor you have, we've seen in almost, um, in all of these theories, you have physiological arousal. So that's factor one. Second factor is going to be now something new, and that's going to be a cognitive label. So some interpretation of what's going on. Um, so what Schachter says occurs is when you have some sort of um, stimulus in the environment. So you have the sight of an oncoming car, same thing we've been looking at in the previous two examples. What's going to happen is, yes, like James Lang theory says would occur, your body's going to react in a certain way. So your heart's going to start pounding. You have a physiological arousal. 
But then, unlike James Lang, which would say this arousal creates an emotion and it creates one specific emotion, Schachter says, no, our body reacts the same way to a lot of different things. And a lot of different emotions have the same physiological arousal. So what needs to occur is this second factor. We have that physiological arousal, and then our mind needs to interpret it. And so our mind needs to take that arousal, it needs to label it as something. For example, here it says, okay, I'm afraid, and then you create an emotion. The example here would be fear. Because you can have a pounding heart associated with a lot of things. Um, in this situation, what happens is your mind kind of has to look at the context, it has to say, all right, my heart is pounding, what's happening? A car is coming towards me. Um, I've seen in movies when a car is coming towards me. Usually that means something bad. I've read in books. I've had previous experiences. I can kind of predict the consequences of this, and they seem pretty terrifying. So taking into account all of these different things, this must mean that I am experiencing the emotion of fear. If you were to take another example that would create um, like a pounding heart, maybe you are on The Bachelor. So you are a contestant on The Bachelor and you've just received like a final rose. Your heart is pounding and Schachter says you need to interpret that somehow. So you take that pounding heart, you think back through, okay, well, I've seen this show before. I know usually people are really excited when this happens. It must mean that like this is the one for me. Like I found like my true love. Okay, this must mean like I'm super duper happy. So you put the cognitive label of excitement, euphoria on that pounding heart. So same physiological arousal, different cognitive label leading to a different emotional experience. So if we were to look at a, another experiment that kind of demonstrated um, what the cognitive theory of emotion is all about. Um, I think I might have told you guys about this one in class before, um, but if not, you get to hear about it now. You get to see my really um, pretty drawing I've made of it for you. Um, and this is just going to demonstrate the fact that we can have a different emotional experience that's completely based upon our interpretation of the physiological arousal that we are feeling. Um, so. Schachter and Singer did an experiment um, where they had um, like college-aged men agree to participate in a study. And so they had two conditions of the study. You had condition A, which you can see labeled here, and you have condition B, which you can see labeled here. In condition A, um, these men were told that they had to walk across a pretty dangerous bridge. You can see here it's like super duper high up in the air. It's probably kind of like one of those bridges you'd see in maybe like an Indiana Jones movie, um, like really, really rickety. He could kind of go plunging to his death at any moment. So condition A, they're walking across this really terrifying bridge, and they're going to meet a woman who is part of the experiment at the other end of the bridge. At the end of the bridge, they kind of talk to the woman. She asked them a couple questions about, like, their experience, um, you know, probably lied to them a little bit about what the experiment was about. Um, so they fill out a survey. After they fill out the survey, the woman gives them her phone number and says, call me if you have any questions about what just happened, you know, and I'll be happy to answer them. So that's condition A. Condition B, this is going to be kind of like the control group. In condition B, same scenario, you have guys walking across a bridge to talk to a woman who's part of the experiment, only this time, it's not really a terrifying experience. As you can see, there's not as much space in between the bridge and the water. It's kind of just like a little footbridge, nothing terrifying. Um, same thing happens. They cross the bridge. They talk to the lady. She again gives them her phone number at the end of the survey, and she says, give me a call if you have any questions. So it's the same situation. The only difference here is in condition A, they're going to be experiencing a heightened level of physiological arousal. Um, and this is due to the fact that in condition A, clearly they're in something that is meant to be terrifying. But what's really interesting about this experiment is the way that people interpreted this physiological arousal. As opposed to their mind saying, okay, you're feeling this way, it must be a product of kind of the bridge, instead they misinterpreted their physiological arousal, and in condition A, a whole lot of the guys ended up calling the female researcher and asking her out on a date. So they kind of took the way their body was reacting, and instead of saying it was fear, they misinterpreted it as being some sort of physiological arousal due to attraction. So in condition A, she was getting all sorts of calls, being like, hey, like, this is kind of weird, but I think I kind of like you. Do you want to go out on a date? Condition B, you didn't see that same kind of reaction. So this experiment is just demonstrating how powerful our interpretation 
of our physiological arousal can be. So you can misinterpret a lot of things. Um, this is why in shows like The Bachelor, for example, they all the time have them doing like really crazy things because they understand that when you put people in a situation where their bodies are going to be reacting a certain way, their minds have a tendency to interpret that reaction as meaning something different. And so people fall in love so quickly on these shows because, you know, they go skydiving instead of saying that their bodies are feeling that way because of the skydiving, their minds say, no, no, you're feeling that way because you must be in love with this person. Um, and so TV shows try to kind of um, make, they try to capitalize on that an awful lot. All right, so we have reached the end of kind of our introduction to the first three theories of emotion. Um, I'm going to leave you with your first of a few homework assignments that you'll have over these couple of days off. Um, so first homework assignment you have is you have to pick one of the scenarios um, that you're going to see actually on the next slide. Uh, it says pick one of the scenarios below, but it's actually on the next slide. Um, and you have to explain the kind of emotional response that this situation would trigger from the point of view of each of the three theories of emotion. Um, so just like as we went through the different slides, and each one of them gave the same situation, you have a car approaching, and then it explained how the theory would explain the emotion, you have to do the same thing. So you're going to take the same scenario for each three theories, um, and you're going to kind of explain the order of, you know, the different components like physiological arousal, cognitive interpretation, emotional experience, and you're just going to provide me with kind of the same sort of flowchart we saw on each of the previous slides. Um, so you give me a flowchart with pictures, you can hand draw them, you can get pictures offline. Um, if you get pictures offline, just make sure you give me the proper citation. And then you're just going to write a really brief paragraph um, just explaining exactly what's happening, what are the order of events, to show that you understand how each of these theories has a different take on how emotion is actually experienced and how emotion occurs. Um, this is going to be due via hard copy on your first day um, back from April vacation. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you certainly know how to reach me. Um, I'm not going to be available to answer answer questions probably that last day before vacation, uh, so I would certainly recommend looking at this and doing this prior to then because uh, I won't be able to answer like super last minute questions. Um, also you shouldn't be saving this for the last minute anyway. Uh, so the scenarios you have to choose from, uh, first you can do the bachelor final row ceremony. Um, I kind of just went through it a little bit, but you're welcome to do that one as well. Um, you get to pick the emotional response that's going to happen. Uh, so you can pick whether or not, you know, the contestant actually gets a rose and is super excited, doesn't get a rose and is devastated. Um, second scenario, you can do a shark attack. Uh, third, you're going on a blind date. Uh, fourth, you have an alien abduction. Fifth, you're in like an Olympic gymnastics competition, uh, and sixth, you have just won the lottery. Um, so you pick the same situation uh, and apply all three different theories to it. You pick the emotion that someone is going to be experiencing, um, and just very simply and clearly take me through the three different theories. Um, I'll, it needs to be on like one sheet of paper. Like I said, you can type it or you can handwrite it, and it's going to be the due, it's going to be due the day I see you guys um, right after vacation.